Welcome everybody to technical talk session three. And we have a tight schedule, so let's get started. So our first speaker is Dr. Brittany Lassane. Brittany is an assistant professor of cell and development and integrative biology and is the co-director of the biological data science core here at UAB. Her interests are in complex rare diseases using genomics, especially integrative, integrative multi-omics approaches. Her talk will be building a computational platform for precision animal model selection and drug repurposing prioritization. Brittany? Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's nice to be here today. I guess I'll take the um, speaker's liberty. I'll just throw in my comment at the end there, Jake. Um, I totally agree. I'm here. I have an engineering degree and a PhD in engineering, and I could get paid more in industry. I'm here because I love the questions and interacting with the students and being part of the academic environment. So just throw my two cents in there <laughs> since I get to be the speaker. So um, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for the opportunity um, to speak today. Um, I thought since I'm still fairly new here, I'd start by just giving a quick overview of my lab's research program. So as Alex indicated, um, we're a genomics and data science lab, and we have the goal of discovering biological signatures to improve patient care and provide insight into molecular processes contributing to disease. Um, there are three related research programs in the lab. So the first is we are a wet and a dry lab, um, and we develop and apply sequencing and analytical approaches. So this is both on the molecular biology genomics assay space. Um, particularly, we're interested in circulating biomarkers and multiomic approaches, but we're also about 70% computational in the lab. Um, so we have to figure out how to analyze all that data and turn data into knowledge. So um, we also develop uh, approaches for multiomic data integration and modeling. The second um, research area in the lab is we predict and prioritize genome driven drug targeting and repurposing. So we have active projects now in cancer, Alzheimer's and rare disease, including as part of CPAM, which I'll be discussing today. Um, and finally, we study the impact of cell and tissue specificity on disease manifestation. So we have active projects in this in PKD, in Alzheimer's disease, and in rare disease. And we're really trying to understand how cellular context, um, context impacts disease manifestation that's associated with a given genetic variant or a genomic instability phenotype. But um, as I indicated today, what I'm going to use my time to tell you about is to introduce you to um, a brand new program here at UAB, the Center for Precision Animal Modeling. Um, it's a recently funded U54 with the goal of becoming a national resource to efficiently and cost effectively analyze pathogenicity of um, gene variants identified in patients with rare disorders and to produce variant specific models to pursue disease mechanisms and targeted therapies. So um, the co-directors of this program are um, Brad Yoder and Matt Might. Um, they also lead the coordinating section. Um, and so they're responsible for providing organization and management, developing outreach and recruitment pipeline for variant nomination, and trying to coordinate access to more complex and sophisticated phenotyping and coordinating the center evaluation. So my role in the um, center is as co-director for the bioinformatics section. And so as you can kind of see just from the broad goal, it dovetails really nicely with all three of the lab's research programs. So um, how does the center work? So I'm gonna do my best to explain that to you in the next 10 minutes and leave you with some teasers about what we're doing in the bioinformatics section so that, um, uh, I can talk to you about it in more detail at another time, um, but my goal here is just to make you aware of a cool new project at UAB and a resource um, for the community. So the way this works is for patient variants for which the UAB or external um, research community would like to um, make an animal model to assess the impact on phenotype or have a model for other studies, including things like future assessment of drug repurposing candidates or other drug candidates. These variants can be nominated to CPAM through the clinical co-clinical section. So that's led by Bruce Korf, Matt Might, and Andy Krauss. Um, and that can be done through the CPAM gateway. Um, here's the web address for that. So you can go check it out if you like. Um, and there's a web form there. Um, so right now, uh, or just generally, I guess, as a, as a center, um, we're supporting projects, not just from the UAB community, but from the broader community, um, which is really pretty cool because there's um, a lot of opportunity for new collaboration there as well. 
So once these um, variants have been nominated, um, the co-clinical section generates what's called a FINA packet, which is um, uh, with a program called FINA tips. And so FINA packets are these this open standard for sharing disease and phenotype information. And um, it's really neat because um, the goal of this standardized um, data format is to improve the community's ability to understand, diagnose, and treat disease. So what it does is it links um, detailed phenotype descriptions with disease patient and genetic information. Um, and this is a standard that was designed to encourage, be encouraged for wide adoption. It is being widely adopted um, and to make it easy to have synergy between different peoples and organizations so that we can try and learn more about the biology together. Um, so that generates this um, variant FINA packet. Um, which, uh, in addition to the responsibilities I outlined, this clinical and co-clinical section is also responsible for things like making sure we have IRB approval for clinical enrollment and coordinating things like iterative phenotyping um, of the human and model systems. So once this um, FINA packet is generated and the clinical co-clinical section has determined that it's um, uh, complete and that it's accurate, um, what they do then is they pass it off to the bioinformatics section. Um, so the bioinformatics section is led by um, Dr. Liz Worthy and myself, and I um, am going to dive a little bit deeper here, given my role and the audience that I'm speaking to. Um, but Liz, myself, and our team are responsible for building the computational platform that CPAM runs on um, for precision animal model selection and for things like drug target and prior, um, repurposing prioritization. So practically speaking, this means that the BIS is building tools and pipelines to aid um, with all the intricacies associated with analyzing, curating, um, and aiding in variant review and prioritization. Um, and so the um, part of this has a lot of different moving parts that I'm going to just briefly touch on given the short time. Um, but that includes things like variant review analysis and reclassification in collaboration with the preclinical section, according to um, ACMG guidelines when necessary. Um, it also um, phenotype definition and exploration, patient and animal model genotype and phenotype comparisons, um, and really just trying to make sure that we have all the information that we can about the variant itself. Um, but this goes deeper. So additionally, um, we provide insights for variant and case prioritization and selection by doing a deep dive into model organism conservation and variation um, to understanding where the variant falls with respect to, a, to given gene annotations, understanding what cell and tissue gene and protein expression is typical in both humans as well as in our different model organisms for predicting um, impact on protein and generally providing rich information and interpretation regarding what is known about the gene or the genes uh, products role in the cell. So um, we have a pipeline that we've set up for this and we're um, working our way through making um, robust tools um, to help automate, automate this process. The other thing that we do in CPAM is for the original um, variant uh, review assessment, we perform an initial um, literature and knowledge database dive. So kind of this top row here um, that includes uh, researching um, potential drug targets from Pharos and PubTator, as well as um, looking for Medicanron targets, which is uh, Matt Mites uh, software for semantic uh, knowledge representation predictions. Um, and then for um, variants, selected to make a model, so not for every variant, but for those for which the center is making a model, we also provide omics-driven driven predictions. So, um, and that's through all sorts of um, using public databases and looking at pathway and signature assessment and things like transcription factor analyses. Um, and then for a select set of those models, uh, either that we've selected or um, as is, uh, being paid for by the clients. Um, we also um, generate RNA-seq or other omics data that's done in my lab um, and do an even deeper workup that includes things like analyses with transfer learning uh, protocols for public data. Um, overall, though, our goal is to identify or predict and prioritize um, therapeutic candidates 
um, through these different approaches. So um, I, given that it was only a 15 minute talk and we're already running a few minutes behind, um, that's all I'm gonna go into for this right now. Um, but I'm on deck to present in the Power Talk series this next academic year. So I look forward in a longer format to, to going through more details of that with you. There are several other additional really critical roles that the bioinformatics section plays. So um, using things like coordinating and providing oversight for the entire data life cycle, um, but using best software and data management practices, including things like making sure that um, what we produce is fair, um, capital F-A-I-R, um, and that we have well-documented, robust, and reproducible systems, pipelines, and tools, because we're um, responsible for uh, collecting and interpreting all of this data for which these projects are being um, determined on, and then eventually curating these reports that are going to go back to our collaborators outside of CPAM. So it's really important that we do this well. Um, so this also, things like QC, storage, integration, visualization, all of these things um, we're responsible for overseeing. Um, and you know, you can imagine it's a hefty task given kind of the complexities of a big center like this. Um, finally, the bioinformatics section in coordination with others in CPAM dedicated to resource and service management, aid in distribution of the genetic and phenotypic information to various public databases. Um, we also work on packaging data um, for model services and, and other dissemination and then support for things like visualizations and publications. So um, as you can imagine, it takes a whole team. And one of the things that I think is really cool about our team is that we have uh, a broad range of folks with different backgrounds. So um, we have folks who are software developers, engineers, cell biologists, genomicists, data scientists, all within the bioinformatics unit. And this, along with uh, the overall interdisciplinary CPAM team, really helps us make sure that the analyses that we're performing are not just correct, but relevant. Um, so we gather all of this information, interpret, um, produce it, and prepare a report that we then bring back to all of um, CPAM. Oh, and these are all the folks that are in, uh, in CPAM. Um, or in the BIS section. And so um, we bring all of this information back to the larger team and we have what we call a variant review committee meeting. Um, and so that is where we take all of that rich information and assess varied impact and model selection. And so the whole team meets to discuss this. So folks from the coordinating section and the clinical section that you've already met in the talk, folks from the bioinformatics section, but as well as um, folks who are actually the ones who are boots on the ground um, making these models um, and these resources available. Um, and so as you can kind of see here on the screen, we have a wide variety of supported um, animal and cell culture models. Um, and the selection criteria that we use broadly as a team, we, we kind of things go up on the Zoom screen and we spend a lot of time kind of pouring over the data and really um, deciding as a group how to prioritize that model. Um, and we can, can be broadly described as assessing things like pathogenicity of the variant, suitability of the models, um, you know, is that is that gene conserved in that animal? What about that particular variant? Um, does that uh, animal system, animal model have the system that's affected in the patient? But also things like what we think the drug potential would be and what the patient impact is, because that's what's really cool here is that these are models that are all connected to patients. So um, the folks who um, the rest of the team that you haven't met yet are pictured on this slide. Um, plus additional staff and students who um, work with these uh, lovely individuals. Um, and so here you can see all of these folks are uh, part of the disease modeling unit that is run by Brad and Bob Kesterson. Um, and they're responsible for producing the in vivo models of gene variants that are identified and developing and implementing technologies here. Um, and then there's a subset of this group that I've highlighted for you in blue, red, led by Deanne, um, that's responsible for acquiring and documenting mutant animal model strains and biomaterials, for um, distributing resources, and for outreach to the community. Additionally, this resource team um, provides access to other unique services. Um, they're the ones that help coordinate between the community and the BIS, for example, for candidate drug target prediction, um, for things like the RNA-seq or other omics assays that I mentioned briefly, um, and for other specialized phenotyping 
So um, overall, these models, characterizations, and drug prioritizations then are available back to the research community. And something that really makes this program unique is the outreach and team building quality. And so we're really proud to have this here at UAB. It's one of only three centers nationwide. The others are at Jackson and Baylor. Um, and so we're really excited to, to be bringing this here to the UAB campus um, and for the research community at large. So um, as of about a month ago, the last count that we had, um, we had evaluated 43 projects, uh, or we had intake uh, for 43 projects, evaluated 23, and there's a whole slew of um, uh, animals that are being made, um, which I won't go through since I'm, I'm trying to catch us back up on time a little bit. Um, but as you can imagine, it's a lot to keep up with. So we've also set up a single integrated project tracking system that's built on top of uh, Microsoft Teams and using um, a project management system called Monday. Um, so I will um, end there since we're coming up on 150, um, but I just want to, you know, a big shout out. This is my group. Um, and thank you to all the CPAM uh, folks um, there. It's been wonderful to work with them. Um, and uh, the folks in my group who are involved in this, Lizzie and TC who and um, Vishal, and thank you so much for your attention and the opportunity to speak today. I'm really looking forward to sharing more with you about CPAM in the future. So I will end there. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brittany. That's a really impressive program you're putting together there. Um, we have just a couple seconds if anybody has a quick question or maybe you can write it in the chat. Uh, yeah, somebody. I try to catch you up. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. So I look forward to your power talk in a few weeks. Our next speaker is Fengwan Huang, a PhD student in genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics in the lab of Zhechen Chong. She's interested in cancer genetics and bioinformatics, and her talk is entitled The Assembler, a Circular Bacterial Genome Assembler. Yep. Uh, Can you share your screen? Yeah, please allow me to share the screen. Uh, hi, um, everyone. Thanks for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to present um, our project. I'm Fenya Huang from Dr. Chong, Zhe Chong Chong's lab at UAB. The topic I, I present is Bexembler, a circular bacterial genome assembler. So accurate bacterial genome assembly is fundamental to understand the evolution and path pathogenesis of bacteria, thanks, for, thanks to deferred generation sequencing, they are increased sequencing data and published draft genome coming out. However, it's challenging to assemble bacteria genome since most of, the most of them are circular structure and contain large proportion of lipidotic sequences. Their existing tools apply only long reads, only short reads or hybrid reads, while they are far from optimism, like most of the long reads assembler are not designed for bacterial genome, so they cannot generate circular genome. And sort reads cannot cover the lipid fragments, so it is difficult to assemble the lipid region for sort read assembler. And hybrid read assembler also have drawbacks, like the popular one unicycular run spade, plus recompile, which is likely to uh, create fragment contact and long assemblies with many structure errors. So considering all this uh, fact, we develop a new method back assembler, which is specific for a uh, bacterial genome. And bacteria, uh, back assembler accepts only long reads or hybrid reads. In uh, long read only mode, if we select the longest read, that cover about 50x of the genome and collect the selected long reads by the remaining reads to produce an initial assembly. Uh, then the two end of the initial assembly undergo the assemble by a subset of reads that map to the end region and the contact generated by the end reads replace, uh, replace the two end of the initial contact. After merging all these two parts, uh, we get com complete and circular assembly. And finally, Bexember arranged the star position to DNA A gene and polished the uh, circular draft assembly with high depth long reads. In the hybrid mode, the key step of assembling collected longest reads, resembling the end reads and forming the circular assembly are the same. 
but it combines accurate sort reads for the collection step, like collect all long reads and collect the final uh, circular draft sequence. So we first take some simulation data and compare with other long reads assembler, WTBG Fry Canoe and Hybrid Assembler Unicycular Hybrid Slate, HASLR and LAVE. The performance will evaluate by quad and all assemblers except a hybrid slate generate one uh, complete contact. WTBG2, hybrid slate and LAVE got one misassembly that represent large scale assemble error and the base accuracy was measured by the number of mismatches and indels per 100 kilobase pair. Both backsamber and fry have the lowest number have uh, have the lowest number of uh, mismatches, and backsamber's hybrid mode can eliminate all mismatches and indels. So as this table. So for the time and memory, WTBG2 and HASLR are better than backsamber, but uh, WTBG2 get higher number of errors and, and HALSLR just cover 90% of the genome. So backsamber surpass all these two on the simulation data and construct, construct a most accurate genome sequence. To text on the real data set, we sequence nanopore reads from uh, mycoplasma and polyphony and hybrid reads from uh, mycoplasma and genini. So since these two strains diverge significantly from the published genome, we cannot use QUAST, which require a reference to evaluate the quality. We introduce new, two new uh, metrics, supplementary alignment and supplementary cluster to indicate assemble error based on the fact that we do not uh, expect to see supplementary alignment or cluster in error-free assemblies. The performance on uh, alpha-lipomy alpha show as the upper part, all the assemblers produce one complete contact and back generates uh, and back Sorry, backsamble generate a minimum number of supplementary uh, alignment and non-supplementary cluster, while WTBG and Fry and Unicycle got at least one cluster and higher number of supplementary alignment. And the performance on Arginini show as the bottom panel, backsamble did the best for generating uh, one complete contact with non-supplementary cluster and highest long remapping rate, while Fry unicycular got small fragments contact and all other assemblers have more than one uh, cluster. To further uh, evaluate the accuracy of backsamblers, we did PCR amplification and single sequencing on 76 locations. They are largest number of PCR reads could map back to uh, backsamblers contact, but and Backsamber got the minimum number of mismetrics and indels in PSA reads. And Backsamber performed well on simulation and Leo, uh, and Leo nanopore data. Besides, it's also available for uh, PET bio data. We download 14 bacteria species PET bio sequencing data from NCTC 3000 project, which provide reference. So we include canoe, unicycular, and fry for comparison. So as this table shows, the bold number, number uh, indicate the best performance among tools. So overall, the back sampler got the least number of contacts, and also it outperformed other tools in resolving the duplication, reach sequence, and generating the uh, minimum number of misassemblies. So for the uh, base accuracy, as shown in this figure, rectangle is back sampler, uh, circle is canoe, triangle is fry, plus is unicycular. Overall, unicycular had the highest number of indels and mismatches, while fry, canoe, and back sampler are lower and close. So all these results indicate that back sampler is also able to assemble pack bio data with less assemble error. So in summary, uh, backsamber is available for long read only or hybrid uh, read assembly. And backsamber outperform the other uh, assemblers as uh, they, it can produce, produce high quality assembly by resolving structural error, reducing base error and intel and generating a circular genome at the same time. So thanks my mentor, Dr. Chong and the members in our lab.
in addition, thanks Dr. Gao, Dr. Lee, Dr. Atkinson, and Dr. Dipwick provide us the data, and the code is available in GitHub. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Feng Wan. Very nice. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so we're going to move on to the next talk. Now, if there are any questions, please type them into the chat. Our next speaker is Dr. Yui Methe, who I guess who recently was professor of biomedical informatics at Ohio State, um, but is now the director of informatics at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Dr. Methe is interested in analytical methods for genomics, epigenomics, and metabolomics for biomarkers and therapeutic targets for disease. The title of her talk is From Collecting Multiomic Data to Inferring Meaning. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen OK and hear me OK? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. OK, good, good. <laughs> OK, uh, so so thanks for uh, including me in this um, uh, in this nice conference. And I, I want to talk to you today about collecting multi-omic data and going from this collection to inferring meeting. So I just wanted to start this by going back in time a little bit and understanding where we are, where we are at today in terms of data and uh, and informatics. And so, around the the forties and fifties, uh, and you know, prior to that, all the measurements in terms of genes or proteins were done at the qualitative level, right? So think, for example, paper chromatography. And it's not until the 60s, 70s that there was a switch from qualitative to quantitative measurements uh, where uh, we are able to also separate molecules more efficiently, for example, with gas or liquid chromatography and, and first generation sequencing. And all this technological revolution that happened between the 50s and 80s then led to an increase in the automation. And so starting the uh, 90s, this is where all the omics started coming in with our ability to make a lot of quantitative measurements in a large number of samples and also in a large number of different types of molecules. And as this expansion came about in terms of the capacity of the technology, the technology was also more and more applied across all sorts of different fields in a lot of samples. And as this is happening, of course, the amount of data is increasing. And so the need for informatics is increasing. So in terms of the training and all of that, that's good news because at this point, the data acquisition effort is less than the informatics efforts, at least in, in, in a lot of the cases. So when we think about multi-omics, uh, there's a wide variety of different types of molecules that can be measured, including metabolites and genes, lipids, microbes, proteins, et cetera. And all of these should be viewed in some type of context. So if you're looking at samples from humans, then you would take a look also at exposures and lifestyle and clinical factors, phenotypes, and that sort of information. And at the end of the day, the goal is to interpret relevant analytes. So analytes, meaning the genes, proteins, metabolites, et cetera. And you wanna interpret those in the context of biology, chemistry, and disease. So you may be interested in looking for novel mechanisms or biomarkers or improving annotations on what is known about these analytes. And in order to get to this point, there's two approaches that can be made. And here they're depicted as independent, but they're actually coordinated. So one approach is to start predicting relationships. Uh, and this involves assessing the data quality and distribution and evaluating the analyte relationships and also associating those relationships with phenotype. And the other aspect is bringing in curated resources. So what do we know about biological pathways, disease annotations of the system or the individuals we're evaluating, 
chemical annotations and relevant meta annotations. And I wanna emphasize the importance of this relevant meta annotations. And this may include, for example, exposures, lifestyle, clinical factors, and, and what, what I was mentioning earlier. So this is a global view and there's a lot of different methods that fall into this prediction of relationships. And there's a lot of resources that fall in these curated resources. And what's important to note is that if you apply different methods, different workflows, sometimes you'll get conversions, but a lot of times you also get complementary information. And that's because most of the time, the methods and the tools and the resources are built for a specific purpose. And it, it's very important to understand what biological question one may be after to figure out which method to use to answer that question. Now, that's a nice idea, but in practice, I'm sure a lot of us have had the experience of, here's a bunch of data, do something with it. Um, and so uh, I think pushing biologists also to be very clear in what questions they wanna ask so that those questions can be translated to a computational problem is important. So I, I'm going to talk about some efforts that we've been working on and are continuing to work on in both these areas. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we created this method, which is a linear based method to capture phenotype specific associations. So broadly speaking, imagine you have gene measurements here on the x-axis and then a metabolite measurement on the y-axis. And if you look for a global association, you're not going to find any. However, if you color code the samples by phenotype, you can see that there's a positive relationship between DLG4 and leucine in the red samples, and there's a strong negative relationship in the blue samples. And this is precisely the type of relationships that we're after. And to capture these, we apply a linear modeling approach with an interaction term. And this interaction term basically measures the difference in slopes between these two lines. And so this approach is valid as an R package and a shiny web app that you can run locally, or you can also run it on servers. And we also include some input data uh, for you to try it out. Uh, and, and more recently, we've added the ability to validate uh, the, the, the models that come out of this and also include other clinical covariables or relevant meta information. So I wanna talk about how we're applying INTLIM in the context of identifying concordance between two asthma cohorts. So these are fairly large cohorts, a couple hundred individuals in each cohort. And we have both gene measurements and metabolite measurements in both. And the outcome of interest is lung function which is measured as FEV1 over FVC ratio. And so we use INTLIM here to infer gene-gene, metabolite-gene, and metabolite-metabolite relationships, and how those may differ with this continuous outcome, FEV1, FVC. And what's important to note here is that in terms of the coverage of metabolites, it is different between both cohorts. And practically, this is often the case. Uh, so if you have measurements on one platform and you're trying to do a meta-analysis with measurements from another platform, you may or may not be getting a lot of metabolites in common. And so when we ran these models, we found very little concordance between the gene-gene, gene-metabolite, and metabolite-metabolite pairs between both cohorts. And this is where we had to go back into a context, a biological context. In this case, we looked at biological pathways. And so we took our analytes that were significant in the INTLIM pairs and ran multi-omic pathway enrichment analysis and found pathways that were enriched in both. And then we were able to visualize the results in a network. And here the nodes in the network are genes or metabolites and edges are whether or not they have a phenotype specific relationship. And if they're purple, note that the purple nodes are the genes or metabolites that are present in both cohorts. So as I mentioned to you, there are few. And then you can see that each color, the green or the orange, are the two different cohorts. So here you can very visually see how you have different aspects of the pathway or different parts of the pathway that are being measured in both, uh, but we're still able to pick up the, the, the pathways that are important 
in both of these cohorts. So this is an example where we were able to get concordance, not at the individual analyte level, but at a broader level on the biological pathway level. So in terms of pathways, I, I, I want to share RAMP, uh, which is a database we also started several years ago, and it's a relational database of metabolomic pathways. And we started this database because we were not able to find an off-the-shelf resource that we could use to come up with better methods for pathway and multi-omic pathway enrichment analysis. And while they existed, it took a lot of work to put them together. And so then we thought, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and make one, make it comprehensive, and then share it publicly. And that's what we did. And uh, currently, we are working on curation of this database. And so we have a semi-automated mapping of IDs across different resources that we use within RAMP. And the different resources right now are KEG, HMDB, Reactome, and Wiki Pathways. And during this semi-automated mapping, we're also able to capture errors, which we then complement with or supplement with manual curation. And our goal is really to make this curation process transparent. So we did find errors where there were wrong ID mappings that came from certain metabolite sources, and then we're able to have a dictionary of those errors that we can make public. And we also go back to the original resource databases to let them know. And so currently we are looking at around 114,000 metabolites, 14,000 genes and enzymes, and 55,000 pathways. And we're also giving a facelift to our front end and uh, moving away from, uh, from Shiny and using Angular to enhance the user experience. And so we're making the database public, we're making the creation of the database public. People can use the RAMP database in their own tools or uh, they can use it in, through an R package or through a user interface. So I wanna talk a little bit about this, uh, how we integrate the, the different resources. And for this, we use a tool that we call Stitcher, which is an anti entity resolution tool. And so the idea is to create this generalized framework to support comprehensive data integration. And Stitcher is used beyond RAMP. Uh, and uh, it's also used in some of our efforts in genetic and rare diseases and also Insight, which has a lot of information on uh, FDA approved drugs. And so globally, this is how it works. So all of the nodes here represent the same molecule, the same drug. However, these individual smaller nodes come from four different sources. And there's a link between one source to the other if they share an ID or if they share a chemical property. And then the algorithm is able to learn this group node here and says, okay, well, looking at these four, they share sufficient number of relationships that I think they're actually representing the same molecule. And note that you can create rules on how these group nodes are found. So you can say, well, I'm going to prioritize this type of relationship more than another, for example, putting more emphasis on a shared inchi versus a shared inchi key. And so using, using this type of approach, uh, this is what we're using under the hood to try to create this semi-automated integrative mapping. Now, part of, part of the difficulty of interpreting the data is that biological pathway information is rather limited. So, you know, depending on the data set, there could be anywhere between 20 or 40% of your metabolites, for example, that map to biological pathways. However, there's a lot more known at, in the chemical space. And so we have uh, lychee, which is a layered, layered chemical identifier. And, and the goal of lychee is to map chemical structures at different resolutions. So there are actually four layers that are embedded into lychee. Layer one represents the topology of the structure. Layer two represents the topology plus the atom labels. Layer three adds on the bond order. And then layer four, you get back the full structure or resolution. So you can take smiles, for example, and convert them into lychees. And so we use lychees 
in Stitcher also to try to see what, what is in common. But you can see that you could also use them to do some type of hierarchical grouping of chemical structures and see if maybe you could infer some of the biological function from these structures. So this is very much ongoing work uh, using these lychees to try to supplement some of the biological pathway. And so I'll show you an example a little bit about how this works and, and how we're using RAMP for this, which again contains both chemical information and also biological pathway information. Uh, and so we have a, um, a PhD student in the lab that has been working on this method uh, that uh, we're calling Metabospan. And the idea is to build a RAMP knowledge graph. And in this knowledge graph, you have the nodes that represent metabolites and genes, and then you have the edges that represent a composite of shared pathway activity, shared chemical similarity, and also other functional annotations that may be available. And this may be, for example, constraining it only to metabolites and genes that you will find to be expressed in a particular biospecimen. And then you can build a consensus knowledge graph from this information. Now the user may input a differentially expressed list of metabolites or genes or both. And you can overlay those on top of this knowledge graph and identify areas of the network that are enriched for this input, uh, in input list of metabolites and genes. And then from these subnetworks, you can perform pathway enrichment analysis. And so recently the goal was to evaluate how this method was working, but also to evaluate what the effect of the database source had and also the pathway coverage on, on pathway enrichment. And so remember that RAMP has information from four different databases. And so you could look at one database at a time or two or all four. And I'll give you some examples of the validations that we're running. Uh, one validation is to look at null data. So null data here means that you were randomly taking in a list of differentially expressed metabolites, for example, and then we're not expecting to get any pathways enriched, right? Because we randomly selected those. And then we count the false positives. And you can see that some methods are more prone to higher false positives than others. Um, and then down here, we're doing the reverse, where we select, say, 30 pathways or 40 pathways, and we take 100% of all the genes and metabolites in those pathways or 80% or, or 60%. And we see, are we able to get back those pathways? And those would be true positives. And so these are the types of results that we look at. We look at both the true positive, so ability to, to get back the pathways that has to, have to, should we should be able to get back and versus the false positives count. And, and you know, we're finding very disparate results. There's, there's some methods that are more prone to true positives versus false positives. And it's really up to the, whoever's running the analysis to decide what is more um, acceptable based on their analysis. Uh, so I, I want to end here with talking a little bit about what our challenges are in terms of inferring meaning. And uh, recently, there was a great paper that came out uh, this month in Nature Comp Science, and it really articulated very clearly the issue of maintenance and how funding mechanisms do not make it very difficult for the open source community to create maintainable uh, uh, tools and, and, and resources. And uh, they reference this SKCD um, uh, cartoon, which I thought was great. And so the idea is that there's all this funding and all this excitement over this modern digital infrastructure. And then this all gets built, but there's always one little dependency, right? And, and, and this dependency may be uh, maintained by some random person for years and years and years and years. And this is fine until this person retires or gets tired of, of maintaining this particular bit of software. And then you can see that the infrastructure, this whole modern infrastructure would fall apart. And, and I think kind of as a field, this is where we're at. And this applies to both tools that look for these relationships between analytes, but also on these knowledge sources. And so the challenges that we have is, is maintaining those and deciding at which point should they not be maintained if there's no usage or, 
uh, or to actually get funding mechanisms to maintain those. Um, also, stitching together resources is not trivial. And so, you know, these individual resources are created for a specific purpose. And a lot of times it's intuitive and necessary to put them together, but it's very hard to do that. And it actually takes a lot of computational knowledge and, um, and savoir faire to be able to pull it off. Uh, agreements on standardization is another issue. Uh, there's, those seem to always be changing. And we, this was touched upon uh, during one of the sessions earlier on, on the training that there's siloed fields of studies as well. And sometimes the stitching together of resources, you need to do this from different fields. And if the fields aren't talking, they may be using completely disparate standards. And so uh, allowing communication and breaking down silos is very important. Um, and then finally, there's just a lot of options. So getting into this field is hard because there's a lot of options, there's a lot of resources, and a lot of times people use what is available and what is easy to them without challenging whether it's the most fit resources or tool to their biological problem. Um, so with that, I just wanted to end and just give a little bit about our informatics course. So we're, we're, we're 34 experts in bioinformatics, cheminformatics, clinical informatics, software developers. Recently, we have UI UX researchers, data scientists, and project managers. And we have a lot of different projects within our, um, our center, the NCATS, also at the NIH and uh, many different types of institutions, academic and, and, and also government like, like the FDA. Um, so uh, there's a lot of people here uh, involved in, in this work that I, that I showed today. And I think one of the most exciting aspects is our collaborative work and, and teamwork. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of bioinformatics or other computational biology informatics related fields is, is this ability to translate and to, um, and to brother bring together different fields of study. Um, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yui. That's a really nice talk. Um, uh, we don't really have time for questions because we've got 10 minutes left and but if anyone has questions, please type them into the chat. Um, our final speaker for today is Mary Button, a PhD student in the lab of Matthew Renfrew in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. And she has an interest in using bioinformatics for high quality, biologically relevant proteomic data sets and phenotype protein complexes. The title of her talk is Proteomic Bioinformatic Analysis of Low Abundance IgA1 Immune Complexes in the Serum of IgA Nephropathy Patients. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, my name is Mary, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how we are developing a proteomic bioinformatic workflow uh, to look at low abundant IJ1 immune complexes in the serum of IJ nephropathy patients. And just to give you a brief background um, in the pathogenesis of the disease uh, IJ nephropathy, we start here with our patients see an increased level of the lactose deficient IGA1. And in hit number two, an anti-glycan IgG autoantibody specifically recognizes that GAL deficiency. And upon binding, they form pathogenic IgA1 containing immune complexes in the circulatory system, which then travel into the mesangium of the glomerulus in the kidney and cause injury. And so today's talk is going to focus on this hit number three, which is the formation of these complexes and specifically looking at what undefined additional serum proteins might be involved in the nephrodogenic effects of the complexes. And so our goal when developing this workflow was to not only just provide that knowledge of what is in the contents of immune complexes, but also new ways to phenotype um, this spectrum of disease, um, but also potentially have this work work for other diseases that involve protein complexes, um, an example being lupus, um, and then potentially look into therapies or earlier prognostics for the disease because currently it's only diagnosable by renal biopsy. So this would be a less invasive alternative that might lead to earlier um, 
uh, treatment plans. Um, so looking at the proteomic side of it, we mined existing LCMS data sets in our lab um, that were used previously uh, for their proteome data. And these were IGAM patients in healthy controls. We took uh, total serum samples and did a jackal and lectin isolation of the O-glycosylated proteins to isolate out IgA1 bound protein complexes. And then we use size exclusion chromatography um, to separate the IgA1 molecular forms. And this is where our sample prep becomes novel because now we're no longer dealing with a large proteome of total serum, but we've isolated into the immune complexes themselves. And not only do we have just that set, but we're able to have two molecular controls to compare to. Um, so this is uncomplex polymeric IgA1 and uncomplex monomeric IgA1 to see um, where these proteins um, lie when it comes to these fractions and if they are biologically relevant in that sense. And so they're trypsin digested and sent through LCMS MS Orbitrap to acquire the raw data. And now moving into the bioinformatic workflow uh, that we use to process this data, uh, we take each of those three fractions that I just showed you before and search them in mascot and X tandem um, and score filter and scaffold. So mascot and X tandem uses a unipro human proteome database to identify all the proteins um, and then scaffold score filters and visualizes the protein enrichment and abundance per sample. And so we also are using um, scaffold perspectives, which as of a couple weeks ago, these two programs have different names now, but they're from Proteum Software. And um, this allows us to have a more biomedical drive with our experiment, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But all patient and control samples were pooled and evaluated quantitatively um, by Fisher Test Statistic. We can look at the tiered total spectral count or TSC value, which is a relative quantitative value look at the fold change in patients and controls, and then we rank the proteins by their fold change and their p-value significance. And because this is relative abundance and doesn't use um, labeled standards, we went into each sample um, in the cohort and evaluated um, just for quality. Uh, so looking at redundant proteins that may have been identified, protein abundance, uh, the sequence coverage, and also patterns in patients and controls in our different cohort groupings. And then using both this qualitative and quantitative comparison, we can analyze then against those molecular controls I talked about earlier, the uncomplex forms of IgA1. Um, I, IgN uh, complexes, the IgA1 is usually in its polymeric form. So we can look in the monomeric fraction, see if we start seeing any of these proteins coming up or see when, I guess in the assembly line I'm trying to convey is uh, that these proteins are actually showing up. Um, and then, of course, doing pathway analysis using Reactome and also perspective tests and pathway um, software inside of it to see uh, what biological systems we're looking at. So scaffold perspectives is basically, um, it's experiment-driven quantitative analysis for proteomics. It's more for uh, biomedical uh, analysis of samples. So I'm able to go in and categorize multiple ways each of these different runs on the mass spec by categories that I choose. So for example, um, either sample type, gender, or ethnicity. Um, and then when I do the statistical testing all in the software, I can manipulate which category I want to actually look at in the statistical test. Um, and as well as, like I said before, the total spectral count or TSC, the relative quantitative values to look at um, protein enrichment without using those heavy labeled standards um, because those are expensive. And so this can give you basically like a jumping board um, to get an idea of what standards and proteins and peptides you would actually want to look at in future assays. And so uh, this principal component analysis uh, tested the protein identification and the corresponding total spectral count. Here you have patient and control immune complexes, patient and control monomeric fraction, and patient and control polymeric fraction. And when we overlay the fractions themselves, we weren't seeing a huge differentiation, partially due to the uh, amount of samples in this data set, uh, but the fractions themselves didn't cluster. It wasn't until we started overlaying the fractions themselves, the different molecular forms within the serum, that we started seeing differentiation. So here in the two shades of blue, are the monomeric IgA control in patient and the polymeric control in patient. 
And then here, finally, adding the immune complex control in patient, which is what we're really interested in. We do see that IgA1 molecular form does matter, and it validates the value of sample prep and fractioning. Um, so just knowing that we're looking at a, a snapshot of the serum that could lead to biological relevancy. And just as a note, um, this clustering we're seeing is not an effective molecular weight because we see proteins of varied molecular weight in each of these fractions. Um, so briefly, just some of the actual proteomic results. We started out with 71 proteins identified in the whole cohort. And after this workflow, we were able to yield 38 IC identified high quality proteins. Um, and two pathways were most enriched, the complement cascade with nine proteins, including some of the following. Uh, this blue indicates a fold change of note uh, between patient immune complexes relative to healthy controls. And then also apolipoproteins, uh, 12, some of which listed here. And so these are proteins that appear to be associated with these galactose deficient IgA, IgG immune complexes. Um, and the significance is actually what we're working on right now. Um, so what's next for this project? Currently, we are uh, using spiked in peptide standards for absolute quantitation. So we're able to go through all of that data that I showed previously and pick out peptides that we see are representative of those 38 proteins that were most enriched in these samples and spike them into um, their heavy labeled standards. So we can spike them into serum samples and do absolute quantification um, and then correlate that back um, to maybe patient clinical characteristics and such to see if we can identify a phenotype. Um, and so this could lead to better stratification of patients by their serum sample proteomic profiles. And um, I'd just like to thank my lab and my committee and the co-authors and of course our funding. And thank you for listening to my talk today. Thank you, Mary, for a nice presentation. Um, we're now at 3.30, so I'd like to thank all the speakers in this hour's